Now, uh, if you notice here, Proverbs 13, 1 starts off almost exactly like Proverbs 12 started off. Proverbs 13, 1 says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. And in the previous chapter of chapter 12, it says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. So we're getting the same concept being taught. You know, if you're wise, if you're smart, you're going to listen up, you're going to receive the instruction, but a scorner... You don't want to have anything to do with it. You're not going to hear rebuke. You know, the scorner is just going to cast it out and they don't care. We ought to have, and, and you know, I love that these verses are starting off these chapters. They're kind of starting off the section to get your heart right, to be thinking, I do want to receive instruction. Tonight, as we go through this chapter, I want to receive instruction. I want to be able to take rebuke. If there's a rebuke that comes at me in this truth, in these verses, if something that I'm doing is wrong, I want it pointed out to me, and I don't want to resist, I want to receive it, and I'm going to welcome the instruction that we receive from the Bible. So let's dig into this a little bit. Now, the previous chapter, I was able to kind of split it up into a few main topics. I've only got two main topics tonight, and then a little bit more of... Um, I don't have a specific title. You know, we're going to be jumping around a little bit like we did last time in the chapter because I did group some things together. But it was kind of harder to come up with a, a real main theme for some of these verses. So bear with me on that. But you'll, you'll see how they fit together. I, I still think, I still know, and I think that these verses are not just collections of random thoughts. They do play on each other and they are um, interrelated to some degree, to some level. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting when you see, uh, um, when, that, when that's opened up, how two seemingly unrelated topics can, can really mesh. But uh, let's, let's dig into this tonight. Look at verse number two. The Bible reads, A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. And that first verse, you know, if, you, if you don't read it carefully, you know, what it's saying there, it says a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. So it says you're going to eat good by what comes out of your mouth, by the good that you speak, by the, by the, you know, the righteous spe speech that you have. And that's why it follows up, but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. Violence. Why? Because the things coming out of their mouth is going to provoke violence, so they're going to get that in return. When you're, when you're speaking right, when you're saying the right things, when you're saying righteousness, he says you're going to eat good by the fruit of your mouth. But the soul of transgressors shall eat violence. And I covered this more in the last chapter, you know, how, 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 how much power our speech has, the, the, you know, the mouth and the words that you use. And, and how we have to be careful and use the right words and, and kind of filter the things that we say before we just go off and say them. Because, you know, the, this says here, you, you, we don't want to be eating violence, right? I don't want to be eating a knuckle sandwich because of some of the things that I say, just, you know, by provoking that, right? There's no reason. Hey, if, I, if I'm preaching the gospel, if I'm preaching the truth, if I'm preaching the Bible and someone comes and wants to smite me in the face, so be it, right? I'm not going to not say what I'm saying here to avoid that from happening. But you and I know very well that there's a lot of words that can be used to provoke somebody to come and hit you for no, you know, for no reason just because you're kind of being a jerk, right? There's no reason to go out and just provoke people to violence. And uh, we need to be careful with, that, with what we speak. And verse 3, um, in addition to, you know, with the mouth here, it says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. You know, it's saying open wide, it just means you're just letting a lot of things come out of your mouth, right? You're not controlling the things that you speak. Your mouth sure can get you into a lot of trouble. Amen. Jump down to verse number 10. On the, kind of on the same note here, it says, Only by pride cometh contention but with the well-advised is wisdom. So I think this ties in very well with that verse 3. He that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. You know, but when you keep your mouth, you keep life. Oftentimes, people who are very proud and are very haughty and very lift up and full of themselves have no problems speaking whatever they want to, to anybody and just kind of letting their mouth run and, and, let, you know, and running their mouth a lot. Those are the people who are real proud, real lifted up. Maybe they're the tough guy, right? And 
That type of pride is only going to bring you contention. It's only going to bring you fights and strivings, you know, when, when there's no point for that. But what the well-advised is wisdom. And if you're well-advised, that means you have good advisors, you, you have more wisdom, you know more. And when you know more, you, don't, you know that you don't necessarily have to speak as much as, as the fool speaks, right? The fool is known for his much speaking. You can have your, your pearls, but don't be casting them before, before swine, lest they turn and, and rend you and they trample you. And they're, they're going to come and, and try to hurt you. Um, we need to be wise about what we speak. But uh, let's go down here to verse number 5 now. Jump back up to verse 5. I don't want to spend too, too much more time than that because we already last week went through you know, the wisdom of, of, of watching what you say. Verse number 5 says, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Pastor Mendes preached a great sermon on Sunday morning. I actually had a chance to hear it now uh, just yesterday at the, from the Red Hot Preaching Conference. He wrapped it up and, and he preached a sermon on Sunday morning. That said, he said, love is hate. Now, the reason why I was called that is because you know, the protesters out there had some stupid slogan that said, love is love. Like, what does that even mean? Love is, well, of course love is love, you know. But what he was getting, the point he was getting across is a great point, is that you can't say that you love something unless you hate the, you know, the anti whatever it is that you love. So by saying that, you know, I can't say I love my children, but I also love pedophiles, right? I love children, which is why I hate pedophiles. I love God, which is why I hate the devil. I love, you know, the things that we love. And if you truly have love for them, you're going to have to love what's going to try to, to you know, be the exact opposite of that. I, I love the good way. I love righteousness. I love God's all, which is why I hate every evil way, which is why I hate wickedness. You know, and the Bible tells us in many places to, to cleave to that which is good and abhor that which is evil. You know, we need to hate what's evil. And we see an example of that here in Proverbs. You know, a righteous man, if you're righteous, you're going to hate lying. You ought to hate that. You ought to just be, oh, well, he's lying, and just kind of blow it off. You know what? It ought, it, you, it ought to be something that you hate. You know, I hate it. I hate when people lie to me. I hate when people are deceptive to me. I mean, it's something just because, why do I hate that? Because I don't lie to other people. Because I treat other people with respect. Because I think that everybody deserves respect of just being told the truth. Now, if I was guilty of lying, if I, if, and if I'm being deceitful, well, then how can I hate it? I mean, then I'd have to hate myself. But a righteous man is going to hate lying. But look at what it says here. But a wicked man is loathsome. See, the righteous man is supposed to hate lying, but the wicked man himself is loathsome, which means he is hated. The wicked man is hated. The righteous man hates lying, but, but the wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Verse number six, righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. And again, you know, these verses are going to, you're going to find these all throughout Proverbs on the difference between, you know, righteousness and wickedness and righteousness and wickedness. And this is still, you know, somewhat generic term, you know, it's not any talking about any specific sin, you know, well, it's just being righteous overall, being a righteous person versus being wicked. And it's just constant reminders kind of interspersed throughout these, throughout these chapters that as we go from topic to topic, as we talk about wealth, as we talk about adultery, as we talk about, you know, drinking, as we talk about whatever, what all the specifics that do come up in here, it just keeps being thrown in there. Hey, by the way, you know, living righteousness, that's going to keep you right. It's going to keep you upright in the way, but the wickedness overthrows the sinner. You know, that, 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 that sin that you want to get into is going to overthrow you. It's going to get the better of you. It's, you think you're going to be in control, but it's going to bring you into bondage. And sin always does that. Right. You think you could just dabble a little bit. You think, no, I could control this. Elizabeth, get your feet out of there and sit up straight. You think you can just get by with it, and you can't. Over, uh, at the end, it's going to consume you, and it's going to overthrow you. And it's just a continual reminder. We're going to see this as we continue here. Look at verse number 9, Proverbs 13, 9. The light of the righteous rejoiceth, 
but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Um, it was real interesting. I was talking to Brother Tom while we were out soul winning today, and um, I think this applies to, to the topic you were talking about. He says, you know, there was a time when he was witnessing the people and, and, and really got on fire for serving God, and he had experienced his joy. And, you know, the light of the righteous rejoiceth. When you're walking in the Spirit and you're doing what's right, hey, that just naturally makes you feel happy. Not naturally, naturally from the Spirit. Right? The Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And when you're walking in the Spirit, you are going to experience the fruit of the Spirit. And when, you're, when, when you have the light of the righteous and you're, and you're walking right and you're doing right and, you're, and, you're, and you're, you're preaching God's Word, hey, there's rejoicing there. It will make you feel better. You know, that is a great uh, antidote for depression. Everybody, I give this to any saved person, anyone who's, who's, who's born again, that struggles with depression, that struggles with being sad, that struggles with being upset. The, the number one cure, I think, for that is to go out and win souls to Christ. Honestly. Now, look, people, you, you might, if you've never gone out so if you've never led anyone to Christ, you might scoff at that. You might think, oh, pff, well, how is that going to help anything? It's because you've never done it before. It really, really, really is joyful. And anyone who's done it before knows that what I'm saying is the truth. Because it is such a joy that uh, you could help to guide a person, to lead them to Christ, to point them to Christ, and to say, this is everlasting life, and you should explain the whole gospel, and to see that person, understand it, accept it, put their faith on Christ, and know that they're saved forever and have eternal life. There's nothing like that. There is nothing like that in the world. And how can you be upset anymore? And I'll tell you what, on my worst days, because I go out soul winning no matter what. I go out, you know, I've got it in my schedule. I go out soul winning on Wednesdays. I go out soul winning on Sundays. And, and those days, for sure, unless something really weird happens, like what happened Sunday, I'm going to the emergency room. Unless something like that comes up, I'm going soul winning. And I'll, get, I'll tell you what, I'm not always in the best of moods. You know, on Wednesdays, I have to work all day before I go out soul winning. I don't always have the best day at work. You know, sometimes things are going on, and I'm not very happy, and I'm not, you know, necessarily even walking in the Spirit. I'm just kind of grumpy and just don't want to do anything. I don't want to talk to anybody. But you know what happens? As soon as I go out soul winning, as soon as I start preaching the gospel, it all changes. And it really does. And I'm not just making this. It's not just for good preaching or something. This is just something that honestly has helped my life in general, and help my attitude and help my mood, you forget about all those bad things. You know, maybe, maybe I just get in a fight with my wife or something. I go out the door. I'm going soul winning. Well, when I come back home, it's a whole different person. I am a whole different person. You know, she might still be upset because I might have said something you know, bad or whatever, but then I'm coming home like, hey, honey, how's it going? You know, you just completely can put all that stuff behind you. And it, and it is, though. It, it really is a joy. It really is good to be walking in the Spirit, to be doing what's right, and to be rejoicing. It says, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Right? The light that they have, that's going to be put out. That's going to be gone. And you're going to be suffering the misery and the, the grief and everything else that goes along with being in wickedness and being in sin. <clears throat> Let's jump down here to verse number 12. Don't worry about the verses. You, know, you don't have to keep track of all these ones. I, I kept track of it in my notes. We're going to be hitting everything. You know, uh, uh, Every verse will be gone over tonight, but I, I kind of have them grouped, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a little bit different. So verse number 12 reads, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. And what that's saying is when, you, when you're hoping in something, it's something you're going to receive in the future. And when it's, when it's deferred, Elizabeth, stop. Pay attention. Don't worry about your sister. When hope is deferred, it makes the heart sick. So it's, you're expecting something, you're hoping for something, but then it's pushed back out even further. And that makes your heart sick. It makes you sad, right? It's kind of a grief to hear, oh man, I was, I was just expecting to have this. You know, you go to a restaurant, you order your food, you're hoping to get it real soon. They put the order, and then it's like, you're waiting around, you're waiting around. 15 minutes later, oh, sorry, your order didn't go in yet. Oh man, what do you, you know, like, and then you got to wait this whole other time again. It's hope deferred. Make it the heart sick. But when the, the, the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. And when the desire finally comes, when you do receive the end of that hope, it says that's a tree of life. It's a good thing. Look at verse number 19. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. Now, 
obviously this isn't just talking those two verses that we read it's not just talking about food right the hope deferred that's not just talking about like like getting a meal because it wouldn't be talking about a tree of life or the uh, the abomination of fools to depart from evil so we're talking about something a little bit more spiritual than just receiving food i just brought up that example to to help explain what those words are talking about just on the surface but the hope deferred you know, oftentimes this could be something more like uh, receiving a, a, a prayer, an answered prayer, you know, or, or um, something along those lines where when it finally comes, that's a tree of life, which brings you great joy. And then, but then in verse 19, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. When, uh, when you do finally receive the things that you've been desiring and wanting to have, it says, but it's abomination of fools to depart from evil. And uh, part of the, the receiving the things that you desire is going to happen by keeping God's laws and, and walking righteously and doing what's right. You know, uh, the Bible says that, the, that <clears throat> God doesn't hear the prayer of the wicked. And I think that goes for saved as well as unsaved. We definitely know that goes for the unsaved, but, but even for those that are saved, when you're walking not in God's ways, when you're not doing what's right, when, when uh, you're not showing God that you love Him, He's not going to be listening to your prayers. He's not going to be answering your prayers at all. You need to be respecting Him. You need to be doing what's right. And a good way to think about this and to understand just the concept overall of praying to God in your prayer life is understanding that He is a Father. It's a great way to understand it. You know, think about it this way. If my children, because when you pray, you're asking. That's what the word pray means. You know, pray tell. It means you're asking somebody something. So when you pray to God, you're asking Him for something. Now, you may give, like we do, we, we give God thanks and ask God to bless our foods. That's not really like a prayer. You know, before you eat, when you, when you give God thanks for the food, that's giving thanksgiving. That's not praying. Even though you may be talking to God, Praying is when you're asking for something. So when you ask for something, you know, as with my children, if my children are just completely disobedient, they know what my rules are and they just don't care, don't want to follow them. And then they come to me, hey, Dad, can we have, you know, I, I want to get this book. I want to get this bike. I want to get ice cream. I want, you know, what are the odds that I'm going to be giving them what they request of me, what they pray of me, what they ask of me? Very, very, very small. In fact, I'm going to be like, get away from me. I don't even want to hear it. You have not been listening to me, so I'm not going to listen to you. And once you could learn to respect me and to, and to listen to my, to my commands, then I'll listen to you. And you know what? The Bible teaches that that's the way that God is. You know, if we want our prayers to be answered, we better make sure that, first of all, we're already listening to what he says. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm praying to God. I'm asking for his help, but I'm not hearing anything back from God. Well, he might have already told you here. You know what? He probably did because there's everything that we need to know is in his book. But you're not listening. You're not reading your Bible. You're not, you're not trying to get your answer from God as you ought to be. And um, definitely, if you're, you know, you, you can see, oh, yeah, getting drunk's a sin, but then you're going out and getting drunk at the bar. Oh, yeah, this is, you know, you, you see all these things. God's telling you not to do this, but then you're going out and doing it anyways. You can't expect God to be listening, you know, just to be all over. Oh, man, what do you need? You know, he's not your genie in a bottle. Right. Okay, he's your heavenly father and ought to be treated as such. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. When you do get that, what you pray for? When you do get those things, you know, maybe, maybe you're praying and praying and praying that God will bless you with having a child. And you're doing all these things, and then he finally gives that to you. Yeah, that's sweet to the soul. You know, whatever that may be, that, that desire that's accomplished. And that's one of the reasons why, and I bring all that up because it's, it's, it's in the context here, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. See, the fool, they're never going to receive their desire unless their desire is something really evil and wicked. But the good thing that's going to be sweet to the soul isn't going to be wicked and evil anyways. They're not going to be able to accomplish what is sweet to the soul because the fool, hey, it's an abomination to them to depart from evil. It's an abomination for God for us to be involved in evil, but for the fool, they're thinking the exact opposite. Like, I'm just going to keep doing evil and, and I can't even think about stopping doing evil. Like, I wouldn't even dare think about not doing something that's wicked. 
and that's uh, and they won't they won't receive a sweet to the soul desire. But uh, and that's why it's important for us to to make sure that we are doing our best to be diligent to be respectful and obey God's commandments so that we can receive that hope so that it doesn't have to be deferred, but that it can come and be sweet to the soul and be a tree of life to us. Jump up to verse number 13, Proverbs 13, 13. Verse 13, the Bible reads, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. And there's, there's actually two verses in this chapter that I have uh, written, handwritten and I have on my monitors at work. And I think this is one of them. And um, I think it's a great, a great verse. You know, those that despise God's word, they're going to end up being dest destroyed. Now, I know that I'm not going to be dis you know, destroyed eternally, but I can just keep this up as a reminder to myself at work. You know, when I wrote it years and years ago, they, um, you know, I put it up there just to, for one, to just help myself remember that um, I don't want to be, you know, my life ended early, as I preached on like a week or two ago. I want to be able to not despise God's word, but to love his word and to always embrace his word. And that's why it says, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. I want to be rewarded by God. You know, I, you know, tell me, oh man, you ought not to be in it for the rewards. You know what? I am in it for the rewards. That's one of the reasons. And there may not be the only reason, but there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rewarded by God. That is not some bad motive. You say, oh, you should only do it out of love. You should only do you know what? If God's going to say, I'm going to give you a reward, what's wrong with that being a benefit? If, if, if he didn't want that to be a benefit or, or a motivation for you, then why would he even give it to you? Yeah. Why would he even offer it if that's such a bad motivation? I think it's a great motivation. Hey, I want to see what God's going to reward me with. God, I'm going I'm to work hard for that. Great. Amen. I also had that verse posted up because we had a sodomite working for us. <laughs> Let me make sure he knows. You despise God's word, you're going to be destroyed. So honestly, that was, that was more of the primary reason I had there. But it's a great verse, a great verse even for, you know, for, for believers to keep this at, at, at heart, knowing that when you fear the commandments, when you're doing what's right, when you walk in and do what's right, hey, God will reward you for that. There is a reward for that. You may think that things are difficult now, but keep your sights on things that are unseen to us at the moment to keep you going and to stay steadfast in your path. Look at verse 14. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Again, more great language illustrating God's law is great for us. It's, a, it's actually a fountain of life. It's not something that's negative. It's not something that's bad. It actually keeps you from things that will bring you death and destruction. The, God's law is good, you know, um, over and over again. I'm going to keep going here. Verse 15, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. And isn't that the truth? You think about people who live a really sinful life, and, you know, you can look at them and be like, man, that person has had a hard life. And it's visible. It's physically visible. You know, people who get involved in drugs and alcoholics and stuff, you can look at people that might be 30, 40 years old, and they look like they're 60 years old. They just look, well, you know, weathered, aged, you know, there's, you know, just everything about them. Why? Because the way of transgressors is hard. You're going to have people who have a lot of misery, a lot of sorrow. They've had a lot of death. They've known a lot of people have died. They've, you know, just, just pain and anguish and suffering. Why? Because that's the way of transgressors. So don't ever be deceived into thinking that, oh, this sin looks kind of fun. Oh, this looks like it, you know, I might want to do this. When God says no, he said no for a reason. It's not to be Mr. Meany that he doesn't want you having any fun. It's because he's looking out for you and he knows the end result of these sins is death. And the way of the transgressors is hard. But having that good understanding, hey, that's good for you. Verse number 16, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. And again, I think this is real simple. I probably should have lumped this in with, uh, with the, kind of the, the, the verses earlier talking about keeping your mouth. Because a fool lays open his father. The fool doesn't care if anyone knows his foolishness. Right? They'll post it all up on Facebook all day long how, how foolish they are. 
you know, and showing all the pictures of them vomiting in the toilet or whatever, you know, whatever's going on in their life that, that's just disgusting and sick and, you know, it's a shame to them. It's their, you know, they're, they're rejoicing in their folly. The fool layeth open his folly. But if you're prudent, you know, you're going to deal with your knowledge. You're going you're gonna to be able to filter what you're saying and what you're showing to, uh, to be appropriate. Verse number 17, a wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. Now, I mean, a messenger, especially in these days, you know, you don't think about as much now with the technology of, of being able to just pick up an electronic device to be your messenger, to get a message across to somebody. But what this is referring to, you know, someone who's an ambassador or a messenger, they're representing you and they're bringing and conveying information between you and someone else. So a wicked messenger says they fall into mischief. They're going to get into trouble and you're not going to be able to rely on that person. But a faithful ambassador is health. It's, it's great to have someone that you could rely on, that someone that's faithful, that you could trust to, you know, with important things, you know, with an important message, with something that, you know, the, the, the faithful ambassador was like the... Um, um, Bathsheba's husband, right? He was a faithful messenger. He's a faithful ambassador. He was able to, to keep Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. I don't know why my mind is totally blanked on that. Uriah was able to bring his own death orders to Joab, in the, you know, the captain of the host, to, to, that ordered his own death, but he was a faithful messenger. And uh, he was able to, to do that. It's... Um, and David completely ignored the fact that he is able to rely on this guy. Obviously, he didn't care about it because he was so self-centered at the time. He was worried about his own sin finding him out. But, um, and his sin did end up finding him out, by the way. There was no way he was able to hide that because even though he might be able to hide it from man, he couldn't hide it from God. And God made sure that he was recompensed for, for his sins. But let's jump down here. Verse number 20. Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You know, it's important to, to make sure you're, you have the right friends. Amen. That you're walking around, among the right group. And listen up to this, okay? You kids especially. It's very important. It's important for everybody. But as you learn and as you grow up and as you gain friends, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that you might be tempted to become friends with. You know, you might see people who are real popular and everybody likes that person. And because everyone likes them, you know, the natural tendency of your flesh is going to be, well, I want to be friends with them too. And then maybe other people will like me like they like them and be part of that group. That's not how you should be determining who your friends are. You want to be getting friends with people. It says here, he that walketh with wise men, with smart people, with people who are saved, first of all, with people who, who know God's, God's word and love God's word are the people that you want to be companions with, that you want to be friends with because they're only going to be good for you. They're going to be help for you. And actually, you know, the, the people who truly love God are going to be the most faithful people. If you want a good friend, get a good Christian because they are people who are loyal. They are people who you could trust. They're going to be people who are going to be there for you in your time of need. You know, the people of this world, the friends of this world, they might be here one day, gone next. They might find something else. You know, a lot of people look at friends and they use people as friends. They don't want to be a friend but they're companions of fools. And it says here, the Bible says that a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Why? Because their foolishness is going to rub off on you. When you become friends and start hanging around with a group of people that are really foolish, that are laying open their folly and just let everyone see how foolish that they are and how unwise they are by not obeying God's commandments and not, not caring about the Bible, not caring about what this book says. When you become a companion to them and become friends with them, it says you're going to be destroyed. Not just them. Why? Because what they do, there's fallout. It affects other people than just themselves. And any time people get involved in, in big sin, it's going to affect more than just themselves. It's going to affect everybody around them too, whether they want it or not. The Bible says in verse 21, the next verse, evil pursueth sinners. Evil follows the sin. So that's why when you're a companion of fools, the evil is going to follow that, you know, that sinner and it's going to affect you too. You're going to be involved in that. It says, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. Verse number 25. Jump down to verse number 25. The righteous eateth 
to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. We're going to look now at, at, a, at a subject here. We're going to jump back up to verse number 4. And we're going to deal with this, with this topic, kind of main subject of, of wealth and having wealth. It's, it's a real broad topic because there's a lot of different aspects that we go into here in, in Proverbs 13. But we're going to start off with verse number 4. The Bible reads, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And again, I touched on this last week, but it's the same concept coming up that if you're lazy, if you're a sluggard, then you're always going to be desired. You're always going to be wanting things. And you're never going to have anything in this life because you're lazy. Because people who are lazy, you don't earn anything. You're not going to get anything. And God's not going to bless your laziness. See, you may, if you're working really hard, if, if you're diligent, you may not even have the best job. You might not have the best job in the world, financially speaking, but you know what? God can see your hard work and give you extra blessing and bless you on top of that. He can cause you to, to receive things completely outside of your job. But if he sees that you're a hard worker and you're doing what's right, because that's one of the things that God doesn't want you to be lazy. He doesn't want you to be a sluggard. He doesn't want you sitting around and watching TV and, and, and just not doing anything with your life, but getting up and doing something. The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. You'll have what, you know, the, the, the desires of your heart, basically, when you are being diligent about it and you're working hard. Look at verse number 7. This is the other verse that I have, one of the other verses that I have up on my monitor at work. I think this one's great, too. And this is a constant reminder for myself of what is truly important in this world. Verse number 7, There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. This life is not all about how much money you can make. As is testament in, in this verse, you know, there are people out there that work really hard, that they're diligent, yes, and maybe their soul is even made fat because they're working really, really, really hard, but they have nothing. The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. Because you're either going to love the one and hate the other. You know, and again, this is a great example for the love-hate relationship. That if you love something, you're going to hate something else. You cannot have one without the other. Jesus Christ even said, look, you either love God or you love money. If you love money, you hate God. If you love God, you're going to hate the money. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve God and mammon. And that mammon just means that wealth, that money, that physical goods of this world. That's what the mammon is. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, or you're going to cleave to the one and despise the other. Those are the words that the Bible uses. Cleave or despise, love and hate. You have to, you know, these are things that are, that, that it's one or the other. It's on or off. You can't ride the fence on it. There's plenty of people out there that make themselves rich with this world's goods and they have all the toys and they have the great house and they have the real, but they have literally nothing. Why? Because it's all going to be burned up one day. The physical wealth, first of all, it doesn't provide joy. It's going to leave you with an empty feeling. It's going to leave you wanting more. When you are just focused on money, guess what? You never have enough. Never. You could have all the money in the world. It's not enough. That void will never be filled. You're going to continually want more and more and more, and you'll never be satisfied. Which is why no matter what you have, you ought to just be satisfied, be content with what you have right now. And why don't you just enjoy what you have instead of being worried about what you don't have? When you're worried about what you don't have, you don't have any joy. Because you're just thinking, oh man, if I just had this, why is everything so bad for me? As opposed to looking at, wow, I have this and I have this and I have this then you can actually enjoy what you do have as opposed to worrying about what you don't have. But if you spend your life focused just on being rich, you've got nothing at all. It's going to be burned up. But the true riches, the true riches are the ones that are going to abide the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. Those rewards that are, are not going to get burned up that's why there's people, it says, that maketh himself poor. There, there is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Amen. And it's not just that they became poor by chance. It says that maketh himself poor. 
You know, there's people that make themselves poor. Why? Because they don't care about the money at all. I could be going out and probably making a lot more money than I am right now, but you know what the cost that's going to come at? I'm not going to be able to pastor this church. I'm not going to be able to go out and do the soul winning. I'm not going to be able to spend very much time with my family. But you know what? I've got the, the skills and the ability to make all kinds of money in this world. I know I do. I know I can do it. But I'd have to be focused on that. And you know what that's telling God? This money is more important than serving you is. And you know what that's going to do for me? Nothing. I'm going to have nothing. But if I say, you know what? I don't need to have this world's good. I don't need to have those riches. I'll make myself poor. You know what? I, I'll cut out the overtime. I'll cut out whatever it is I need to cut out other than just supporting my family and do the work that God has for me, the, the actual important work. Yeah, it may not pay very much or anything, but that's where the great riches lie. That's when someone can really have, I mean, great riches. Think about that. It's not just having a little bone or something tossed to you. When God is going to reward you, He's going to reward you greatly. And I believe that 100% that God is not a stingy or a wicked boss. You know, you, maybe you've only ever worked for a wicked boss or someone who just never wants to pay their employees what they're worth. They never want to give them anything. That's not how God is. Don't think about your boss at work as someone like, like that would be godly. Because I think God's a generous God. I think God is an extremely loving and wonderful God. And the Bible says, you know, it's not entered into the heart of man. Or I mind, you know, we haven't even considered, we can't even think about the things that God has prepared for us. What God has prepared for us, when Jesus, you know, the mansions, the rewards that God has laid up, the crowns in store for those that, that are serving Him and, and are going to receive reward. Hey, I think God's going to bless and be abundant with, with, with what He gives. Paul says, the ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 49. Psalm 49. Because this the Psalm 49 ties in with this last verse I just read there in Proverbs 13, 8. The ransom of a man's life are his riches. It says, ransom, it says, are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Psalm 49 we we'll start reading in verse number 6. Psalm 49, verse 6, the Bible reads, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, being in honor, abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. Now we're going to keep reading here, but I'm just going to go over what we've already read to this point here. It's saying, look, the people that trust in their wealth, that that's where their confidence is, is, is in how much money they've made. They boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. They brag about how rich they are. It says none of them, no matter how lifted up in pride they are and how much they think they have it all, none of them can redeem their brother. Or give a ransom to God for, for him. So you can't pay God off with your, with your stupid riches, with what you think you got so much wealth. You think God's impressed with how much money you got? You think you're going to say, oh, here, I'll throw you a here. God, I, I, want my, I want my brother to be, to be saved. I don't want him going to hell. So, you know, we don't want, to, we, we, we don't want to, to accept the way that you paid out for us. But you know what? I've got all this money. Here you go. As if you could just buy this guy's soul. It says, for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. You, don't, you, have no, you do not understand the value of a soul if you think it could be bought with money. If you think any amount of riches in this world can actually cover the price of one soul. 
It says, for he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish. Verse number 11, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue ever. See, the people are lifted up in their pride and, and they're trusting in their wealth. They think their houses are going to last forever. They think, I'm going to build this great name and I'm going to build this great city. I'm going to call it after my name. You know, and you look throughout the Bible, that's what people did. I mean, they, they built these, these cities and these dwelling places and, and, and they were named after them. You know, you got the city of David. You've got many, many, I mean, almost every place in the Bible literally is just named after the people that live there. To all the tribes of Judah, they had their different areas. They had, you know, names. And everywhere you go is named after, uh, in, you know, almost everywhere you go is, is named after people that lived there before. But that never lasts forever. I mean, the names change, right? When, I mean, when the children of Israel came into the promised land, what did they do? They changed the names. You know, this is a place that used to be called this, and now it's called that. You know, it, it you know, used to be called Luz at the per first, now it's called Bethlehem, you know, whatever. All the different places that have changed names. Why? Because people conquered them and say, well, now I'm calling after my name. But at the time, they're thinking, they're so high and mighty and so proud, my name's going to last forever. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Verse 12, Nevertheless, man, being an honor, abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. And again, honor. Remember that word. I've gone over this so many times. And as you see, it's come up over and over again in the Bible. It's not just referring to respect. In so many cases, referring to more than that. Honor is being, yes, respect, but also the, the, the wealth or the money or the, you know, whatever in the context going along with that. Man being in honor, having this wealth, having this, these riches, abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased, for when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Can't take it all with you. Can't take any of it with you. All you can take with you are the eternal valued goods, which is the souls of men, the souls that you reach for Christ. Right? The good works that you do for God, that is what matters. That has eternal value. People we need to be focused on people, not things. Not the goods, not the money. Like I said, you could mass up and hoard it all up and build storehouses and build banks and build vaults and, and everything else and have it all sealed and locked up and think, man, I got all this stuff right here. And then, boom, the next day, just gone. Dead. And then where's your stuff going to be? We're actually going to see where it goes. Look at verse, go back to Proverbs 13. I'm going to go out of order for my notes a little bit because it just, it just works out perfect for what I was just saying. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 22. The Bible reads, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Look at this. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. God's saying that, you know, these sinners, these wicked people that, that, that think they have all this wealth you know, amassed to them and, and, and they, they feel so secure and they're so proud and they think their name's going to last forever. He says, that wealth is laid up for the just. He said, you know, God said, you know what I could do? I could just destroy you and give all of your wealth to the people that you hate, to the people that, that are not wicked, to the just ones, the people who are following me. He's like, I could just take this and just put it over here. And that's what I'm going to do with it. And they think they have so much control and so much power and they're so powerful in this world. And God's going to bring them to nothing. But it says the good man, and, it, and I believe this to be important too, and this is something that we need to keep in mind. As much as, we, as much as we are not focused on money, it shouldn't be the focal point of our life, it shouldn't be our driving factor of just how much money I can make. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So you're still thinking ahead. You're still thinking in the future. You're still keeping some savings. You're still being prudent with the money that you have in order to help your family out down the line. Hey, a good man's going to do that. Now, I'm not saying it's all about money. You just need to be focused on money all the time. Of course not. We know that. But what the, the things that you do have, be wise with it. The money that you do have, whatever it is that God's given you with, you know, 
try to leave something to help your family out behind you, you know, after you, that, that you look after, your children's children, leave a blessing for them, a good man will do that instead of just consuming it all on yourself. Whatever it is, that you, I mean, even if it's, you know, whatever God's blessed you with, try to save a little bit to be able to leave for an inheritance for your children's children. Jump up to verse number 11, Proverbs 13, 11. The Bible reads, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. You know, what's vanity? It's worthlessness. It's, it's you know, not working righteously, but just receiving stuff um, by vanity. It says that's going to be diminished. That wealth is going to go away. But he that gathereth by labor shall increase. You know, wealth gotten by vanity would be like winning the lottery. Or receiving some huge amount of money just for no work involved, for no reason, right? Vanity. I mean, I think of vanity of people... You know, and I don't know much about the industry or anything, but like models, I'm like, oh, let me take your picture and you're going to get all this money for it or whatever. Like, that's wealth gotten by vanity. Or like the, the Clintons who go and speak for, for a group of people and get like hundreds of thousands of dollars in their speaking fee. They're not working for that, okay? I'm not saying there's zero work involved to give a speech, but that is wealth gotten by vanity. But that's going to be diminished. The Bible says that doesn't last. But when you work for it, he that gathereth by labor, so that's going to increase. And one of the reasons is, you know, the wealth that's gotten by vanity, especially people, the lottery ticket example, they blow through that and they spend it because they have no respect for the money they've got because they already live their life wasting their money, throwing it away, on, you know, gambling it away or doing whatever and have no respect and, and, and knowledge on how to deal with it. When they get it, they get it by vanity. It's just gone within like, year, within like a couple years. But he that gathereth by labor, when you work for something, you care a lot more for it. When you have to work hard and then you finally are able to have enough to, 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 to purchase something, you're going to take a lot more care of that when you've worked hard for it than someone who just right. doesn't matter to you. Oh, I had all this money anyways. Who cares? It's like monopoly money, right? Verse number 23, Proverbs 13, 23, much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. And, uh, you know, the tillage is, is the, the piece of land that you till, that you're actually working at. So even if you're poor, what this is saying, if you're working, because you have a tillage, you have a piece of land that you are actually tilling and working at, there's much food there. And you'll be provided for, but the, the implication with the, of the tillage is, is work is that you're working for it. So even if you're poor, there's, hey, there's plenty of food there to provide for you. It says, but there is that is destroyed for want. And want means a lack of, for lack of judgment, for, for their lack of understanding, for lack of judgment. People are destroyed for that. Verse number 18, Proverbs 13, 18, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Now we're going to get into the last point here. Look at verse number 24, Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now that word betimes means early. So you want to nip this thing in the bud. When, you, when, when the child starts acting disobedient and rebellious and not, you know, not listening to you, it says, bring the judgment, sweet, you know, you know, don't spare the rod. Now, a lot of people have had a lot of, you know, these, these theologians have a lot of stupid understandings of the rod. They say, oh, it's this loving rod, it's the shepherd's rod, you've got to pull them to the side and kind of lead them and guide them. That's false. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, I mean, there's no other light way to say it. That's not true at all. When it's talking about the rod, and because, you know what, and I'm going to prove this to you, we're going to go through Proverbs tonight. We're going to go through the, up, up, all through all the verses that talk about disciplining your children in the proper way. When it talks about the rod, it's talking about a spanking. It's talking about a beating with a rod. A rod is a wooden, you know, stick or whatever. That's a you know, I don't have to spell it out for you, but that's what a rod is. And it says if you spare the rod, if you withhold that, you see your child's you know, acting up. They need to be corrected. They need to be disciplined, but you, you withhold. And there's many reasons why a, a, a parent might withhold correction. The biggest one is probably out of laziness. Or you don't want to hear their crying. 
because it's a long day, you've got all this stuff going on, and your kid's just, just being a, a nightmare, and you know they need to be punished, but you could say, well, I'm busy, I've got all this other work to do and stuff, and, I, you know, and they're finally just being quiet. I know they're getting in all kinds of stuff and being real bad they shouldn't be doing, but I'm just going to you know, look the other way because I don't want to hear it from them, and I, you know, I don't have time to deal with it. The Bible says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Your children deserve the attention, positive and negative. They need the attention. If you're going to raise your children right, they need the, of course, the positive attention, the love, the care, everything, you know, the, the praise, everything that goes along with that when they're doing good. But they definitely also need the negative attention. You cannot have all of one and none of the other, regardless of which one it is. You cannot have ju just all the love and, and, and then no, none of the discipline, none of the correction. You'll just, just, oh, you're so good. I mean, th this is the type of society now the kids being raised these days, that's how they're being raised. Because the majority of them are from split homes now. And what you have is, is, is this weird family structure where mom and dad don't talk to each other anymore because they're split up and now they're vying for the affection of their children and instead of giving them what they need, which is proper discipline, proper correction and instruction and telling them, no, I want my child to love me more than they love mom. I want my child more to love me more than they love dad. And how do they do that? By just giving them whatever they want, by not being mean to them, by not making them cry, by not taking anything away from them, by not being a parent, by being a buddy. The people that treat their children like that, they hate their children. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. They hate them. I mean, if you spare your rod, you hate your son. No, I don't hate him. Oh, okay. I'll just say that God's word is wrong then and you're right. No. I'll take God's word. I'll let God be true, but every man a liar. Amen. Now, that may seem harsh to you, but let that sink down because... This is God's holy word. This is instruction and righteousness here that if you spare your rod, you hate your child. You hate your son, but he that loveth them, if you truly love, he says you're going to chasten him, which is discipline them early, betimes. You're going to do it early. You're going to catch it and get it taken care of right away. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18. Proverbs 19, 18 reads, Chasten thy son while there is hope, which is tied in with what we just read about chastening him early betimes because you want to be able to correct your child while there's still hope because there's going to get a point to where there's no more hope left for him. You're not going to be able to correct your child. For example, I mean, if you don't discipline your child and then they grow up and they become like this older teenager, 16, 17, 18, and you've never corrected them when they're young, it's, prob it's probably hopeless at this point to try to bend them over your knee and give them a spanking and actually change their outcome and their behavior when they've already gotten that old because you haven't done it from early on. Chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. And I brought this up, I think, just last week when, when I was in here with my daughter. We have one daughter that... that Man, her, she screams bloody murder. I mean, you, could you, you don't even have to touch her. And she's already wailing, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You think, like, man, this is what a hell must sound like because she is just screaming her head off, right? But you can't spare for that crying. And look, it's not joy. It's not, it, I'll tell you right now, it's not joyous. And any parent knows this who's, who's disciplined their child, who's corrected them, who's spanked their child knows it's not like I get some great pleasure out of spanking my children, other than knowing that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm correcting them and showing them, hey, because the kids need to understand that there's consequences for their actions. I'm going to get to that a little bit. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to start seeing a little bit more evidence now, because I already told you that, that this, this concept or this notion of the shepherd's rod, of kind of guiding them along, is false. As we read the language in these Proverbs, about the rod, you'll see why I'm saying that's false. Because you, if you just look at Proverbs 13, 
You say, well, there's not enough evidence there to convince me. Well, look at Proverbs 22, verse 15. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And isn't that the truth? Because they don't know yet. They don't know any better. They don't have wisdom. They don't have knowledge. They've got a lot of foolishness. It's bound in their heart, man. You leave a child to themselves, you know, you know, they're going to bring their mother to shame, but, but they're going to get into all kinds of trouble because they're foolish. They're going to do things that are foolish. I remember when I was left to myself at one point, I got these, this paper clip and went and stuck, you know, just to see what would happen. It's foolishness, right? I mean, it's stupidity. I didn't know any better. Was, you know, just, oh, I wonder how, what this will do. Kids do that stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. The foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but it says, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So we're getting a little bit stronger language. Okay, you say, well, I'm still not convinced. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 29, 15. Proverbs 29. We need to drive that foolishness out of the child. I mean, that's literally what you're doing. You're taking the rod of correction. You're giving them the, the appropriate discipline. And, and you know what? It works. And you know, anyone that's going to tell you it doesn't work, they don't know what they're doing. They're doing it wrong. Because this is the prescription that the Bible gives for disciplining and chastening your children, for rearing them. I could tell you for a fact that it works. I know it works with every single one of my children, even the screamer. <laughs> and with some of my children, one of my child... I don't even really need to spank them. I mean, as soon as they just see that I got that spanking stick, I mean, it's like, pfft, correct, corrected, working, doing what's right now. They don't want that discipline. It's a good means of, of having a negative consequence associated with their actions, so they don't do the bad actions anymore or nearly as much, or, you know, it's, they learn from that. Proverbs 29, look at verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom. So it's also important here, we see that it's not just the rod, it's not just the spanking, it's not just the beating, but it's the reproof, it's the correction, it's the verbal, hey, this is what you did that's wrong, this is what you need to do, this is why I'm punishing you. I mean, it's a shame when kids just, they do something and... Because they don't have understanding, they don't even realize what they did. The next thing they know, they're just getting beat. And they're like, I don't know what I did. You know, that's not going to help. You need to be able to tell them, this is what you did that's wrong. Because sometimes they may not know. You might think it's obvious. Like, How do you not know that? Right. Well, because the foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And they don't have the same wisdom that you do. You need to teach it to them. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When they grow up, your mother's going to be ashamed when you don't discipline them. Verse number 17, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 23. Turn to Proverbs 23. We're going to close with this last verse. Proverbs 23. If you're still not convinced about the rod and how it's supposed to be used, it cannot get more clear than Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. Okay, we're talking about correcting our child, right? Doing, giving them discipline or whatever. It says, For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Strong statement. Very clear. I don't think there's any way you could interpret this passage other than Hey, I need to beat my children with a rod. <laughs> That's what it says. Now, the only thing that would probably need to be explained in today's language is the word beat. When we hear the word beat today, you think of someone getting beat up. You're thinking about someone black and blue, bloodied, and everything else. That is not what the Bible is talking about with the beating. Okay, and, and it shouldn't even need to be explained that way. Well, I'm going to explain it anyways because, you know, the, the, the word has changed ever so slightly to that, to that concept or that notion of, of thinking. Because you hear about people beating their kids, right? And it's horrible in, in the sense of beating their kids, like punching them in the face, giving them black eyes, breaking their arms, things like that. That's despicable. 
Okay, amen and amen. That's not what the Bible's talking about, though. God has provided an area, a padded area of our body that is meant to receive that correction where you are not going to inflict damage or injury unto the child, but you are going to give them the, the pain sensation that they need to feel to understand that, hey, there's consequences for our actions. And this is why it's so important. This is why the timeout method or these other methods that don't actually have physical pain associated with them as, as a result of a proper spanking with the rod... When the Bible adds in here, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. This goes down very deep into, into our development as people as at a, from a young age. If they understand, hey, when I break my dad's commandments, there is a physical stinging sensation that I don't want to experience as a result of my actions doing wrong, disobeying, being rebellious, brings, ow, that hurts. We're, we're living in a world where people are transitioning now, young people, I don't believe in hell. I don't think a loving God would send anybody to hell. I don't think that it's real. I mean, you mean to tell me that God's just going to throw somebody in hell and they're going to be burned and tortured and tormented forever? I don't believe in a God like that. Why? Hey, were you ever spanked as a kid? No. I had timeouts. You don't have the consequences, the physical consequences for your actions. It's going to be a lot harder to accept that... The Father in heaven has consequences for breaking his laws. And that it is a physical, bad, painful experience that you don't want to have to go through. It's not popular these days. A lot of people are against it. You have these social justice warriors out there that are, want to turn you into the cops and call CPS on you for, for beating your kids, for giving them the appropriate discipline and spanking. But I'll tell you what, if you love your children, you're going to do it anyways. I do it. I don't care. I mean, I try not to be just, just wait, you know, like, it's not everybody's business anyways. Usually, you know, when I'm correcting my children, I'm not just trying to make a big example out of them. You know, it's already shameful that if they, if they do need to get corrected and disciplined, so I try not to do it in front of everybody. I try to be as discreet as possible. But if they need it, and if, if I'm in a public place or I'm somewhere, you know, I'm going to go to somewhere, you know, relatively private, but I'm still going to give them what they need because they need it. And I don't care what anybody's going to say or do about it. I'm going to raise my children the way that God says that I ought to be raising them and raising them the right way. Amen. And, uh, I, you know, another thing, we shouldn't be afraid of what other people are going to do or say or think. You know, maybe if people saw it a little bit more often, it would be a little bit more accepted like it used to be. Right. Back in the day, 40, 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't, wasn't even an issue. Right. I mean, you see a child getting, getting their butt whooped by their parents. Well, that's, they should, you know... It's normal. It should be normal. Because that's the way you raise your kids according to the Bible. And like I said, you know, I mean, I was focusing on the discipline aspect of it. Obviously, there's more to rearing children and training them up and giving them instruction and everything else that goes along with the full upbringing of the child. But specifically, when it comes to the correction and disciplining, you know, if you spare your, the rod, you hate your child. Bottom line. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction that you've given us. God, I pray that you would please just help us to continue to grow um, in our knowledge, in our wisdom, Lord. Open up the scripture to us. God, help us to make the changes in our lives, dear Lord, that we have the proper humble attitude to receive correction where needed. And um, Lord, we, I would much rather receive the correction through your words and receiving it that way than receiving the chastening from you, dear God, that, that you will bring to every child that, that you love. I mean, and, and you love us all as, as, as believers, dear Lord, as children in Christ. And um, we know that you chase and encourage every son that you've received. And, and I pray that you please help us to be wise enough to not have to endure that chastening, but to receive it from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.